Welcome to Emotional Savvy, the Relationship Help Show. I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler. If you're ready to increase your confidence in conversations and conflict, deepen your self-awareness, expand your connectedness, and enrich your relationship with yourself and other humans you care about, and even those you wish you didn't, you're in the right place. Enjoy today's episode. Hello and welcome, welcome to Emotional Savvy. I'm glad you're here as I always am. I'm glad if it's your first time, I'm glad if it's your 50th time. And know there are lots of episodes for you to go back. If you enjoy this, go back and listen to others wherever you prefer to get your podcasts. I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler. We have a show today about emotional abuse of children. And I want to put a few thoughts out there Um, about this kind of thing because we often don't realize for a long time that we were actually abused when we were children. Maybe we were were neglected when we were children. Many, many kinds of abuse. So just a few thoughts about that to get us started today. Abuse is any behavior that is designed to control or dominate another person. Any behavior. So whether that is through fear or humiliation, intimidation, isolation, guilt, blaming, manipulation, or denial, it doesn't matter. So therefore, emotional abuse is simply any abuse that is emotional rather than physical. And that can include belittling or discounting or manipulating the emotions of another person constant criticism, threatening, keeping you in a state of uncertainty and ambiguity. All of these things can be emotionally abusing. And it can be less obvious than that. It could be continuous disapproval or refusing to ever be pleased by a person in any way. Or it can be given children age inappropriate behavior or engaging in age inappropriate confidences. When a parent tries to engage a child to take his or her side against the other parent, this too is emotional abuse. And you know, I write about these things. I talk about these things. I post memes about it. If you want to follow me on Facebook, please go to facebook.com slash relationship help doctor and follow along. So you'll always see when I post something. So emotional abuse of children is often more subtle than just the systematic wearing away of their self-esteem and their self-confidence because emotional abuse really cuts to the core of a child's being and it creates scars and impressions and perceptions that are far deeper and longer lasting than physical ones often. And it attempt to distort or to undermine a child's perception of the world is emotional abuse. So here's an example from my practice. I have clients all over the world. You can learn more about that at 4relationshiphelp.com. So I was talking with a new client recently and she told me that her husband, without ever speaking to her about it, had told the children that they were getting a divorce. So imagine what this potentially did to the children. So what's wrong with this case? Let's take it apart. First of all, the parents had not yet decided between them to get a divorce. Secondly, the parents did not have the conversation with the children together, which is the only way to do it unless there's severe abuse of a physical or sexual nature. Third, the children were being used as pawns in the game of make mommy wrong. Fourth, the children's lives were disrupted by information that could only cause an emotional upheaval for them. And in this case, that information was inaccurate. Fifth, the parents may not be getting a divorce 
which then leaves the children confused and unnecessarily upset. And sixth, and there's probably a whole lot more I'm not thinking of right now, but the father was attempting to get the children to be on his side against the mother. Now, this is emotional abuse of the children. He purposefully played with their emotions with the intent of making them side with him, the husband, as he went into detail about mummy's bad temper that was causing the divorce. So clearly the father was not thinking about the children or the impact on the children. He was thinking about himself. He wanted to be the one who had the children on his side. He was manipulating the situation to his advantage. Now those children are under the age of 10 and they have no ability to comprehend the idea of divorce except in a very self-referential way. So it is abusive to tell them that a divorce was pending when no such thing had been decided or undertaken. And talk about trying to make the children understand something they don't have the capacity to understand or the brain development to understand or the emotional intelligence to understand. These children were too young to process that information. And at their ages... They were still very concerned with parental approval and parental love and very concerned about their own survival. And they have no ability to separate out things using logic or consequences. So another problem in this scenario, at this age, the children will at some level, they will believe and internalize that they could have done or can do something to prevent this or worse, that it's their fault. You know, I think I've mentioned to you before about children and their brain development many times. I know I've talked about that, but I may have mentioned this situation. I once had two little girls in my office who came to see me because their parents had recently separated. The father had moved to another house and the mother was concerned. And so was the father about the children and their response to it. The children were seven and five, two little girls. And I said to the girls, do you know why daddy has a new house? He moved to his new house. And the five-year-old said, oh, yes, I know. And I said, well, honey, what do you think? And she said, oh, it's because I left my bicycle behind his car. That's what the five-year-old brain could think. It had to be something that was her fault. She was the center of the world. She made it happen because she left her bike behind the car. So think about this situation. You just go willy-nilly and tell these two children under 10, what the father says, your mother and I are getting a divorce. Where does it put the child in their ability to think and their ability to reason or have logic? So with these children at this young age, they thought it was something that was their fault. And that's true, whether or not they give voice to it, that's what they're thinking. And it could easily affect their lives and their perception of relationships for their adult lives. So I'm not being an alarmist here. I'm talking about brain development and brain chemistry and neuroscience and psychological development and emotional growth and all these things that are happening with children. And this happens all the time because I have so many adults that I see. And when we trace it back, things like this happened. And they've not thought about it before or they haven't really been able to isolate what happened that caused them to think about the world or relationships or the possibility of love or partnership in healthy ways. So, yes, this is emotional abuse of children and it's completely unnecessary. But I'll tell you one thing. Emotional abuse is something that immature people engage in. And they're emotionally immature or they have grave difficulties like the hijackals that I speak of because they have to be the one in control. But this kind of emotional abuse of children is something that we have to be on the alert for as well as look at it, what happened to me? What happened to me in my young life? Did, were there some pivotal events that changed my thinking, my way of perceiving the world, my way of thinking about relationships and what's possible? Because if there were, we really want to fix that. And I hope you do, because you don't have to, to take on what was given to you when you were young. And you did take it on at some level. 
And if it's impeding your life, you want to figure that out. So let's work together. You can always find me at 4, F-O-R, Relationship Help, H-E-L-P dot com. And I look forward to walking through that with you and figuring that all out. But the main thing I wanted to share with you today is let's be very clear when we're parents or we're interacting with children, that we are not inadvertently providing emotional abuse to them because we don't honor the age and stage they are and the development that they have. So this little bit of emotional savvy is just for you today. I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler, and I look forward to talking with you soon. Stay tuned. Welcome to Emotional Savvy, the Relationship Help Show. I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler. So glad that you're with us for this segment. We are talking to an expert, a true expert, as we often do. And I've been really looking forward to have Janice Webb on my show. So welcome to the show, Janice. Thank you, Roberta. I'm happy to be here. Well, I'm delighted that you're here because in a previous episode of Emotional Savvy, we talked about childhood emotional neglect and I so wanted you there because you are the expert. So let me tell everybody why Dr. Janice Webb is the expert. She's a licensed psychologist, an author, a speaker, and a blogger who's dedicated to increasing and bringing awareness to that phenomenon known as SENSE, which is childhood emotional neglect. And she wants to bring that to everybody and I'm so glad that you do. She wrote her first book about SENS called Run, Running on Empty, Overcome Your Childhood Emotional Neglect, and it was a hit. Obviously, that's why I wanted her on the show. <laughs> and, and then as she worked with those concepts and realized it was time for another book, she wrote uh, another one called Running on Empty No More, Transforming Your Relationships with Your Partner. So we've got great things to talk about, so I'm really super glad that you're here. So what led you to be interested in this field particularly? You mean childhood emotional neglect? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, um, I was having this experience as I was seeing clients in my practice of seeing this same kind of expression in a lot of different clients that didn't seem to have anything else in common. And these people, you know, like I said, they, they didn't have, they, they came from all different walks of life, different careers, different childhoods, yet they were telling me all in different words that they had a deep sense of emptiness and sort of disconnection and lack of fulfillment, and they were having struggles in their relationships. And in looking for what had caused this, I was looking for trauma and abuse, and I couldn't find it. Um, to explain it. And then I realized this is not anything that happened to these people when they were growing up. It was something that failed to happen for them while they were growing up. Their parents had failed to notice and respond enough to their emotions. And that was when I put two and two together and realized I got to do, I got to take this to the people because they need to know about this. Oh, and I'm so glad you had those moments of clarity <laughs> because helping somebody, isn't that the best feeling when you can actually pinpoint, I've got some questions for you because I think I know what might have been at the bottom of what's, what's going on for you. And that's yeah. a wonderful moment, isn't it? It is, but um, not everyone can see it very easily just because it, they don't have a memory of it, right. you know? You can't remember something that didn't happen. And children <laughs> don't know that someone should be saying to them, what do you feel or what do you want or what do you need? Or um, I see how you're, what you're feeling right now. Let's talk about this. And if it doesn't happen for them, they don't even know it's something to remember. So I think it's hard for therapists yeah. to find this in their clients. I think it is, you know, and I'm just doing a big project with Dr. Gary Salyer on attachment. And one of the things that he talks about is we have a right to be welcomed by joy. And even when we start to look at, you know, when were you really welcomed by joy into the world? Were you in a prenatal environment and, you know, and a neonatal environment that told you how wanted you were, how valued you were, how glad they were you were here? <laughs> and then that plays out into all the things that you've discovered, I'm sure, right? 
Yes, absolutely. I think a lot of kids, you know, babies are born into families who just aren't that excited to have them. And that's definitely a source of childhood emotional neglect. But there's a continuum all the way up to families that really want the child and love the child, but just simply don't understand emotion and mm -hmm. don't know what to do with it. And so inadvertently discourage the child's emotions. So I think it's that um, whole continuum there. Oh, what a horrible phrase. Discourage the child's emotions. Can't you just feel all the shutdown in that? All the, huh? <laughs> you know, where's the communication? Such isolation it creates. It's like putting out your fire. Like yeah. just taking a damper and dampening you down. Sure. And, and you just, you wouldn't even know why. I mean, there you are, this little blob with a relatively undeveloped brain running on sensory input. And all of a sudden you feel like, hey guys, does anybody care? I'm here. Um, can anybody respond to me? You know, what are some of the things that a person could look back on? What, what feelings would be engendered? I know I've read many of the things you've written on Your Tango. So everybody go to yourtango.com and read articles or go to Dr. Janice Webb's website, which is emotionalneglect.com yep. and read, read, listen, buy, do, because if there's something kind of unfinished and unsure and unsettled and mysterious, that's exactly what you're addressing, isn't it? Yes, it's kind of, it's almost like a gaslight treatment of a child. It's sort of like, oh. because your feelings are such a deeply personal biological part of who you are, and you have them whether you want them or not, it's like your right arm. So it's sort of like growing up with everyone acting like your right arm wasn't actually there. And it just <laughs> makes, the it makes the child feel like, what is happening here? I better hide this. I better pretend I really don't have a right arm. And so the child pushes yeah. his or her feelings away just to cope. Yes. And what richness is removed right then to not be safe to have your feelings or express your feelings because no one will respond to them. So is it a kind of shame response at some level that, you know, I, I have these needs, but I shouldn't have these needs? Yeah, I think uh, I've seen a lot of adults who are, and this is one of the, the best tells of someone who has childhood emotional ne neglect, is someone who really hides their emotions. Mm -hmm. And um, as a therapist, I've seen, I've had so many people sit across from me in my office, tell a horrible, tragic story and have tears and start apologizing for having tears. Oh, it's me great. too. Yeah, yes. there you go. Yes. It's like it's a sense of shame or this makes me appear weak or I'm unfairly burdening my psychologist with this, right? Isn't that the case? You know, that's interesting because, you know, my immediate response, as I'm sure yours is, is this is an appropriate healthy feeling. It's an appropriate response to something that was pain. Please don't be sorry for it. Be delighted that it showed up. Yes. Right? Yep. But yes, that's a great tell, Janice, because... When somebody is, is like even apologizing for their tears or worse, apologizing for having a feeling. Yes. It's, yep. a, it's a demonstration of not having the right to exist. Yeah. And, and that whole thing, you know, I, I really work often with the sort of um, the seven centers in the body at, at where did we get the right to exist the most basic thing and do we feel it can we actually embody that i have the right to take up space and draw breath exactly i think um when you grow up with your feelings so tamped down it makes you feel like you don't deserve to take up as much space and it makes you feel sort of invalid as an adult like you're not quite as important as everyone else it's not conscious, usually. Yeah. It's unconscious. Yeah. So what happens to a person in a relationship when they feel from an early age they don't have the right to take up space? Well, <laughs> several different things can happen. Um, it depends what kind of people are around you and who you end up attracted to. Some people with childhood emotional neglect are most comfortable around other people whose feelings are also tamped down. Mm -hmm. Because then they're not challenged and everybody's comfortable, right? No one's going to threaten anyone else with any strong emotions. But the other thing that can, be, that can happen is that um, people with CEN can end up being drawn to people with big emotions because 
that oh. way, it's sort of like a moth being drawn to the flame, right? It kind of gives them permission, you know, that by projection, by like, curious oh, you, feeling. Yeah, you can have big emotions and it's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, that's interesting because immediately what happens is you say that a person with CEN is attracted to a person with CEN. I'm just seeing this flat line, <laughs> right? Like, and then they have a child. Yes. Like, oh my goodness. Like if both people can't have their emotions, how did they ever get emotional enough to think they should marry? Right. Is it then, more of a logistical arrangement or is it a safety thing? What do you think? Um, maybe sometimes, but I think um, a lot of times it really is love. It's just the form of love that it's, it's a CEN version of love. You know, I've seen people who've been married for years who both have it and they have a very sweet bond and a love for each other, but they just don't, the emotion is, just not squelched. It's squelched. So yeah. they both feel kind of deeply unfulfilled on some level. And that happens if a non child, non neglected person marries a CEN person. Usually the non CEN person feels distant. And the reason they come see me is because that person is saying, look, something isn't right. Something is missing in our marriage. And the CEN person is saying, I don't understand. It's fine. I don't get it. No, because the, the one who isn't CEN is leaning in and leaning in and leaning in. And the CEN is backing up and backing up and backing up. <laughs> yeah, the way I describe it in um, Running on Empty No More um, about relationships is that one partner is knocking on the other's wall and no one answers. It's just like constantly, let me in, let me in. Yes. And, and that can be so sad for both people. One of them, not so much recognizing it, but the other saying, I have so much to give you and I don't have a place for it. Right. And, and that can become very damaging to a relationship. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's, it can lead one or both people to end up quite angry and frustrated. And it's sort of a path where you start out really close, feeling really close. And then over time, it just, you kind of drift apart. Yeah, well, when you're distant from your feelings, then you kind of hold other people at a distance, consciously or unconsciously. And, and after a while, that could get very old. Yeah. Yes, yes, it might feel comfortable. But since Feelings are what connects and feeds relationships. If yours aren't in the mix, you're going to miss out. So how do, you, how do you actually become more confident and assertive if you have experienced CEN, childhood emotional neglect? Uh, how, do you, how do you work with that if that's in your background? Well, it, over time, I've developed a whole system that really works. Um, and it's just a series of steps where you begin to try to knock down the wall that's blocking off your feelings. And you can partly, one of the most effective ways to do that is to just decide that you want to feel. It's amazing how powerful that is for so many people to just decide, I want to start feeling my feelings because they're in there. And once you put your mind to feeling them, they start to come. And sometimes it's bit by bit. It's, I've never seen anyone get over flooded, which is what most people are afraid of. Yeah, I would imagine. Yeah, but it doesn't really happen that way. Um, it's slowly, slowly. And especially, you know, I've developed some techniques that you can use to like help yourself feel. And then um, once you start feeling, then you can start learning the skills to manage feelings and you can learn what your feelings mean and how to process a feeling and, there, there are tools that you can learn. It's not too late as an adult to learn all that. And then after you get that kind of taken care of within yourself, then you have to learn how to express a feeling without fear, I would imagine, and risk telling your partner what you feel because it would be terribly vulnerable in the beginning. It's never been safe to tell your partner anybody what you feel mm -hmm. and then the overwhelming joy of having somebody actually interested in that must be phenomenal yes it's an incredible feeling of validation for a lot of people and the people who have the best uh the best experience with this are the ones who can tell their the people around them the people closest to them 
this is what happened to me when I was growing up. This is what I'm working on. I'm going to be doing this differently now. Mm -hmm. And here's what you're going to find. And a lot of times you don't get great responses at first because people are not used to that from you. Well, of course, because, you know, what I talk about in, in some of my books, Janice, is that people have this this image, you know, in the old detective shows on TV, if there had been a body on the floor, they would have a tape outline of it. And the couples that I work with are all over the world, so they're all the same, just as yours are, I'm sure. <laughs> and, and I say to them, you know, you are so afraid if your partner puts an arm or a leg or even a toe out of that tape outline that they know you are <laughs> that they're going to tell you get back in the tape outline you know mm -hmm. how, no no I need to know who you are and when you show me that you're changing that really rattles my cage I I don't I, I don't feel like I've got that nailed down anymore and that's a huge growth process which creates enrichment and dynamism in the relationship but you have to be willing right yeah, absolutely. And it, it does help even even if a partner or a, someone else in your life, your friend, your sibling, your cousin knows what's going on. When, the first time they say, what movie do you want to see? And you express an opinion, they may not be real happy. That's just human nature. But it's important not to give up and just keep at it because people who love you will adjust. And I, I like your idea of actually just putting out a little preamble that you know i'm learning to express my feelings and as that i may actually have an opinion <laughs> and I, I i want you to be gentle with me as i do this and i'm enlisting your help mm -hmm. because to even ask someone to care about your feeling is a huge positive step in your process it is it's a way of valuing your deepest self and mm -hmm. that's so important it's goes completely counter to those old messages of emotional neglect that you grew up with. And yay for that. Yeah. Right. Because this is like coming out of a cocoon. It's a real metamorphosis, isn't it? If it you is. don't, if you don't think that your feelings matter and that no one's interested in them and you shut them down and tamp them down so much that you don't even know. Like one of the things that I have my clients do is because in one of my books, I have a process of communication called the personal weather report. And in order to be able to communicate with your partner, you have to know truly what's going on within you, of course, just like you're saying. Mm -hmm. So I have them set their cell phones for five times a day, the alarm. And when the alarm goes off, all they have to do is breathe themselves down for just three breaths, you know, kind of get still and just practice asking themselves, what do I feel right now? What do I think right now? What do I need right now? What do I want right now? Mm -hmm. And just practice because particularly people who have experienced childhood emotional neglect, they don't have the answer to those questions readily at hand. Like, oh no, I'm here for what do you need? What do you want? And I'm on hypervigilance trying to make sure that I don't offend you. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, exactly. And so it becomes a really good practice for any of us to take a moment every now and again and say, you know, become present and say, right now, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? What am I needing? What am I wanting? Yeah. So that then later we can express that to somebody else and we have it to offer. Yeah, the really important thing about that, too, is um, that growing up with emotional neglect is like being encouraged to always be focused outside of yourself. Right. And this is why I really encourage people to learn meditation, because it trains your brain to focus inward. And that exercise you're talking about, I do a version of that as well to help people tune in. And it's all just about paying attention to your inner self, mm -hmm. which can feel wrong when you were discouraged from that as a child and have yes. to override those old messages. Exactly. And I, I too, I encourage people to meditate uh, always, but I used to own a health and yoga retreat. <laughs> so, you oh, know, wow. it's very important to me that, that people spend time with themselves alone on purpose mm -hmm. and not be afraid of who's there. All right. So we keep ourselves extremely busy to be afraid of who we'll meet if we meet ourselves. <laughs> and exactly. I think that that's very important. And when we become important enough to ourselves to give ourselves attention, then we can become important enough to someone else for 
them to give us their attention. Yeah. And, and, you know, I say all the time, Jenny, you can't give a gift you don't have. You may want to give that gift, but you don't have it to give. So you must develop it within yourself so you have it to give. And that hypervigilance, what do you find about hypervigilance in people who have experienced childhood emotional neglect? Um, hypervigilance. Hmm. I don't know. It's not something I've encountered a whole lot of as, as like a problem. Hmm. Cause I would imagine that the ability to calibrate what's going on in the external environment is so much greater than any knowledge of what's going on in the internal environment that we become somewhat hypervigilant. Like, uh, am I safe here? Are the giants in a good mood? Um, what's going to happen? So you learn to calibrate all the time what's going on around you at quite a quick level. So you know, I find with my people um, that that have been in situations where they're with somebody who is constantly trying to dismiss, degrade, or demean them, that they become hypervigilant to you know, am I safe? Can, do I need to stay out of their way? Can I please them in some way so they won't go down the path I don't want them to go down? Yeah, I mean, I can totally see that if, if you're in a relationship with someone who might be dangerous, you know, emotionally dangerous to you. Mm -hmm. But I think if you have a parents who are somewhat abusive in some ways, that sets you up, you know, combined with childhood emotional neglect, that sets you up to be hypervigilant as an adult. Do you consider childhood emotional neglect abuse? I think it has to go, I think it's sort of like the, um, the underbelly of abuse. Mm -hmm. Because any child who's, who's abused is obviously emotionally neglected, right? Because you can't hurt a child without ignoring their emotions. Mm -hmm. But um, I think you can definitely be emotionally neglected without it reaching a point of abuse. So, and I think it's really helpful to separate the two out because when you combine them, the emotional neglect gets lost. Abuse is so much more obvious and visible and, you know, talked about and, and known and tangible that emotional neglect just falls by the wayside. So I tend to talk about it separately. Yeah, I can see why, because, you know, when you're talking about the opposite of something, <laughs> you're speaking about a void, an empty yeah. space, an absence. Yeah. And to be able to identify something you've never had and recognize its absence is more difficult, isn't it? It's much more difficult. Yeah. yeah. So abuse versus neglect. One of the ways I've explained it is that abuse, abusing a child is more, is like knocking over a plant. Whereas Neglect, emotional neglect is like failing to water it quite enough every single day. They both are going to, you know, just damage the plant and cause all sorts of problems, but they're just very, very different. One's more violent. The other is yeah. like deprivation. And what do you think about shame in this situation? How does shame play in to someone who's had childhood emotional neglect? when you grow up with your with such an important deeply personal part of you ignored it makes you feel like you shouldn't have that deeply personal part of you and yet it's still you can't escape your emotions even if they're blocked off they're still there they still bother you and they come around and they show themselves sometimes so people with who grow up with emotional neglect tend to get kind of shame prone a lot of them not all of them but it's hard to feel like your most, your deepest self is not acceptable. It sets you up to feel a lot of shame. You know, I, I think you're, you know, the more we talk, the more I realize that this deep underground cavern that you talk about is a place that so needs touching and exploring. And I'm thinking about listeners now. Remember, you can go to Dr. Janice's website at emotionalneglect.com, learn more. But if you're actually beginning to resonate with what we're talking about here, that if you have that kind of eviscerated feeling, that empty feeling, that, that place in you that is like, uh, I don't really feel whole, this may be a, a place of exploration. Yeah. I mean, for a lot of people, it's a sort of an emptiness or a feeling of being 
different from everyone else, just something everyone else has like this rich ingredient that I'm missing. Mm -hmm. um, that's really common. And I did create a questionnaire to help people figure out if they have childhood emotional neglect, since it's so hard to remember. And that's also on my website. So people can take it there. It's free. And that's great. And that that's free, a gift for uh, you from Dr. Ginny's web. And it's in the show notes. So if you just want to go into the show notes, um, you will see the link and it'll take you directly there too. So you don't have to remember all that. Um, but that's a great gift to give people because in the privacy of your computer life, you can go and say, is that the hole I'm feeling in my soul? Mm -hmm. And that would be a very important thing to figure out. So what happens um, to people in relationships with themselves over time do you see that there are one or two ways that they tend to develop differently more than others like are they more prone to perhaps um being <clears throat> difficult in a relationship or more prone to being passive in a relationship do you see any patterns um it's definitely not difficult it's more overly cooperative and overly giving and overly focused on the other person so relationships of people with childhood emotional neglect tend to be tilted in the direction of the other person, mm -hmm. even if the other person doesn't want that. So would it be a version of codependency or is it something different in your mind? I think it's um, something, I think it's on the same continuum, but codependency, for something to be codependent, you have to be really doing it to a very detrimental degree. Um, and with childhood emotional neglect, I think it can happen to lots of different degrees. It can be just a mild, um, you know, not talking about yourself enough or hiding your feelings or not talking about your problems. So it doesn't reach a point that you would call it codependent, but it's so, still a problem. Right. So I just got from what you said there that disclosure might be a big issue. Mm-hmm. Because believing you actually want to know about what goes on deep inside me would be a bit difficult to get used to. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. where did all that interest come from? You know, no, no, let's talk about you. Right? Yeah, that's another sign of someone with childhood emotional neglect. <laughs> Yeah, I find that fascinating. And I did read several of your articles. I had read them before, but I looked over them this morning. And I really invite everyone to go and read this. Um, again, go to emotionalneglect.com. This is really important. Remember the free gift at, um, you can get a checklist to see if that has in fact any resonance for you. And then what, what can people do as a first step? Would you invite them to read your book, to contact you? What would be your, your best next step? Um, I would say, yeah, take the questionnaires, step number one. Um, once you take the questionnaire, you get on my newsletter, so you receive a whole lot of information. Reading Running on Empty, Overcome Your Childhood Emotional Neglect is a great step, too, because that's a really comprehensive view of how emotional neglect happens, what it's like, how it affects, and it has a lot of real people stories in it. They're Great. Very relatable. So here's the big question to take us out. Okay, I think you've presented a lot of hope that this can be healed. What's your experience with healing it? My experience with healing it has been amazing. Um, walking people either in my office or in my online emotional neglect recovery program, walking people through these steps of getting in touch with their emotions, learning the skills and starting to apply them in relationships. You literally watch people blossom. It's like watching people come alive. Yeah. And it's been one of the most rewarding things I've ever experienced in my life. I think it's incredible. You know, I, I just get the image of blooming, you know, like if you, you can be a bud forever because you've not been watered quite enough. <laughs> uh -huh. So I can hear that your program finally is, oh, my soul's been watered. Now I can, now I can bloom. That's yeah. beautiful. It's like that. Yeah, so thank you so much for being my guest. Thank you for all you do, all you've written, the depth you've gone to. It's an enormous contribution to the emotional life of every one of us.
thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. Oh, you're so welcome. My guest today on Emotional Savvy has been Dr. Janice Webb. Make sure that you go and learn about this. It may be affecting somebody you know. It may be something that you need to know, particularly if you work with children. All of these things are things that will enhance your ability to engage in healthy relationships. Go to emotionalneglect.com. And when you want to know more about my work, you know where to find me at 4relationshiphelp.com and on YouTube at 4relationshiphelp. We'll talk soon about another great subject with another amazing expert. I look forward to talking with you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for being here for today's episode of Emotional Savvy. If you want to deepen your emotional savvy, make shifts in your relationships, and enjoy life and relationships more, work with me, Dr. Roberta Shaler. Get my books, enjoy my courses, or work with me directly. You can do that by visiting 4relationshiphelp.com, F-O-R, relationship, H-E-L-P.com, and subscribe to Tips for Relationships now. Don't miss a thing. Be empowered this week with more emotional savvy. Oh, 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 oh